good to be here. I'm Chanel Lali. You might know me from MTV's Girl Code. I was in the last season of that show, which was also the last season of that show. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> I got that stuff right out of here. They were like, it's a show where ladies give other ladies silly advice. I was on camera like, ladies, the first time we break into his phone, let's add one of our fingerprints to that security system. <laughs> the producer was like, fade to black, fade to black. <laughs> She's going rogue. We knew it was gonna happen. I'm originally from Philadelphia. Yeah, I'm happy y'all been there and made it back. I like that. I like when my city lets people go nowadays. Very progressive. People always ask me why I made the jump from Philly to New York. I tell them it's because I realize comedy is hard. But you know what I should try? Poverty. <laughs> to challenge myself. <laughs> See how bad I want this. Let me try paying twice the rent. See if that <laughs> motivates me. <laughs> it has. <laughs> I rob people now. <laughs> Dimly lit in the back. I've robbed a few of y'all. <laughs> I feel nothing. <laughs> That's just how New York City makes you. <laughs> Even to rent a room as a young woman here? Oh my God. Every Craigslist ad sounds like it was written by a hipster, Christian Bale, an American psycho. <laughs> Just lists of unreasonable demands. Hello, welcome to my Craigslist post, a little about me. I like to start every day with a thousand push-ups <laughs> in the common area. I don't allow any carbohydrates in my household. I'd prefer it if my roommate was dead. <laughs> so desperate, so fired up, I wrote that guy back. I was like, well, is it 420 friendly or not, sir? I got a lot of places to look at. It's good to be here. I was on the road. I was in Portland, Oregon. Very cheap weed there. Suspiciously cheap, I'd say. Bought some weed from a guy there. I said, hey, how you making a profit on this? He just ran off. <laughs> Met a fancy barista when I was in Portland, as you do. <laughs> Told him I was a comedian. He said, oh my God, my wife loves comedy. I'm gonna take her to your show. I'm gonna take her to your show. And later on that night, he did. <laughs> They Googled me, they bought tickets, they came to my show, they're great audience members. That is so nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of weird, right? <laughs> After the show, they bought me a couple drinks. I was like, so what's up? You guys trying to fuck me? Or <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> They were like, no, we like to support strangers. I was like, wow, you guys are freaks. <laughs> You're all fucked up. <laughs> but I realized that's just the New York City in me. That's how New York City has made me. Because if I'm in Manhattan and I tell a barista, hey, guess what? I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> I'm a comedian. <laughs> they are always like, yeah, me too, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm five years in. What you want to drink, ho? <laughs> then I gotta take a step back. Like, Stacy, baby, I thought we was cool. She's like, stop coming in during my shift. <laughs> like, I can afford that coffee without her. <laughs> I feel comfortable with you guys. I wanna let you know I'm a biracial. I'm a biracial person, which is funny to me every Woo! time I say that out loud because I feel pretty black. <laughs> I feel very black every day when I wake up <laughs> and go outside. But growing up, I didn't know I was biracial. Had no idea I was biracial until I was in junior high. Girl ran up to me at school very out of breath, like, Chanel, I saw you last night at Target with this old white lady. And she was buying you a bra. What is going on? <laughs> And my first instinct, I was like, whoa, Chelsea, that don't even sound like me, okay? 
you need to wash your mouth. This is how rumors get started. <laughs> then I thought about it. I was like, I was at Target last night, but I was there with my grandmother and she's not a white. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went home <laughs> and I walked up to my grandma that day bold as brass I pointed in her face and I said hey are you white? because a girl at school looked at you she saw a white lady now I'm looking at you I'm starting to see a white lady too <laughs> she said of course I'm white what'd you think I was? I said I never thought about it before. <laughs> I knew that I was black because of BET. <laughs> so I just assumed by association, my grandmother was probably black too. Like I knew she wasn't very dark skinned. She never as much fun as us on beach days, but we all got our shit. Who was I to judge? She said, no, I'm 100% Italian, which means you are part of town. She told me that her parents Moved to Philadelphia, my hometown, from Italy. She pulled out a picture frame, showed me two very nice looking white people. I said, holy shit. <laughs> my whole life, I thought that was a brand new frame. <laughs> and you had just been waiting to fill it. <laughs> Everything is a lie. Like, yeah, I thought my grandmother was a little lazy. I didn't know she was white. <laughs> I didn't know that. And sometimes when I tell that joke, people don't believe me. They're like, how could you been 13 years old? You know your grandmother was white. Well, she had three oil paintings in her house. One was Malcolm X. <laughs> one was Martin Luther King Jr. And one was a black Jesus on the cross. <laughs> Do you know how many pictures of black Jesus there are? I don't even know how she found a dread-headed Caribbean Jesus. <laughs> but that shit affected me. I'm dating a Jamaican now. <laughs> shit is stressful. <laughs> I always feel like he's judging me. <laughs> now I'm 33, I know my ethnicity and uh... <laughs> I'm still learning a lot about myself. It wasn't until this year that I was able to admit that I'm the jealous type. I'm one of those women, but not in the traditional sense, more so in the sense where I don't like it when my friends tell me about their other funny friends. I don't wanna hear about that shit. It could be something small said to the side. Like, yeah, I was at work the other day talking to Jenny, you know, you would love her. She's so funny. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean by that? Wait, what, you, you like Jenny's jokes? <laughs> Does Jenny make you laugh? <laughs> it's cool, I just, you know, I remember a time when uh, I could make you laugh just fine. <laughs> I remember one time I made you laugh so hard, you cried a little. <laughs> and then you peed a little. <laughs> I ain't tell nobody. <laughs> I'm a good friend. <laughs> Does uh, Jenny make you pee? No, I don't think she does. No, no, if Jenny's so funny, just tell me where Jenny lives. <laughs> Let's go to her house right now, see if she makes me laugh. <laughs> Why do you keep trying to leave? I already locked the door. Come sit down <laughs> and tell me about your funny friend. <laughs> you know what's sad is that that's the most honest joke I have. <laughs> As we bring down the third wall, I'll let you know who I am. <laughs> I get jealous. <laughs> but I've been keeping it very chill during the pandemic. Very chill at home, watching a lot of natural disaster movies. Because in black households, those are repurposed. We just call them white people crazy movies. <laughs> you know the ones I'm talking? I'm talking Dante's Peak. <laughs> I'm talking all the movies with sharks. <laughs> I'm talking Twister. You guys remember Twister? It stars a young Helen Hunt. How they pull that shit off? I don't know. <laughs> Movie opens on Helen Hunt. Tornado comes down, takes her dad away. Does he die? We don't know. Maybe he moves out of Oklahoma, starts a tech company. We don't know. All we know is the final moments of his life are spent trying to grab that cellar door. Camera zooms in. We see the cellar door is only closed with one of those slidey metal bathroom stall locks. That's all he had. 
That's all he had. He was like, his family's from tornadoes. Of course he didn't come back. <laughs> and then Helen Hunt grows up. She becomes an adult. She's like, I'm gonna avenge my father. I'm gonna find the tornado that did it. And I'm gonna stab it. Which is not at all how tornadoes work. But in this movie, she's like a scientist. She's got a 401k, it's ridiculous. They trace a tornado, they find out it's heading toward Helen Hunt's aunt's house. And that's personal for her. It's at that moment she realizes, this must be the tornado that killed my daddy. And now it's going after my auntie? They race over to the auntie's house, try to save her. The auntie is a G. She's sitting on the porch eating pancakes with her bare hands. She's like, I'm out here. You know? I had a dog, it barked. I knew a tornado was coming. Y'all need to relax. So they listen to her, they take a night off, they go to the drive-in movie theater, because I guess that's fun in Oklahoma. They get to the drive-in movie theater, and guess what happens? A tornado comes to the movie theater. Like the tornado intercepted the group check. And it just showed up, like, what y'all doing? Oh, I ain't know he was taking the night off. Didn't nobody tell me that. That's just me being a tornado. So, uh, so they gearing up for the final tornado chase scene in this 1990s action drama, executive produced by Steven Spielberg. Yes, I do know too much about it. And in this final tornado chase scene, unfortunately, the wind blows and Helen Hunt's bangs fly back. And for the next seven minutes, we are blinded by forehead. We lose everything, plot points, character development. I cannot even tell you how this movie ends. I have you know, I told this exact joke in a room where Helen Hunt was seated to my right. I could see it. It destroyed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Helen Hunt didn't like it. She didn't think it was appropriate. Which I think is my life's work. <laughs> I tell you what, this pandemic goes on too long. I'll write a joke for every shitty movie she been in. 